Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Guide Training Seminar 2022 uh, virtual edition. My name is Chris Zielinski. I work for Grand Canyon Conservancy Field Institute. I'm here with Joel Barnes from Prescott College. He's got some really incredible things to share with us. So without further ado, take it away, Joel. Thanks, Chris. So uh, again, thanks for, uh, for joining the virtual Grand Canyon Field Institute uh, Guides Training Seminar. And uh, really what I'm going to talk with you today is about uh, landscape, cultivating a deeper sense of place through uh, experiential education and landscape studies. And with the hopes of giving you as instructors and lovers of Grand Canyon, some tools to really explore landscapes more mindfully. So um, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're really going to explore these two questions. How can you and your participants deepen your sense of place in Grand Canyon through landscape experiences? And as we travel through these landscapes, what stories can they reveal? So, at the nexus of cultures and landscapes lies a profound and compelling mutuality. Landscapes have profoundly influenced cultures through the millennia since time immemorial. And more recently, let's just say since uh, the Industrial Revolution, um, cultures have influenced landscapes more profoundly. So it's really been interesting to see the, uh, if you, when you study this interaction between cultures and landscapes, you realize that landscapes influence cultures, influence landscapes. It really is a profound and compelling mutuality. And when you're in a, grand, uh, in a landscape as compelling and empowering as the Grand Canyon, what a great opportunity to help your students get in touch with how do they fit into that landscape? How do they fit into any landscape? So let's briefly look at like the evolution of the Euro-American relationship with landscapes. Um, when we first arrived, came across the Atlantic, um, our perspective was much more anthropocentric in nature. The emphasis was on human values and human centric values, practical, utilitarian, materialistic, and religious. And then thanks to folks like, uh, Henry David Thoreau um, and uh, um, Walf, Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Transcendentalist period, um, we gained, became to appreciate nature for more recreational, aesthetic, even spiritual reasons. We also began to learn more about how nature works, and that gave rise to um, these biocentric and ecocentric perspectives. Now, of course, today, the anthropocentric perspective in terms of political, economic, and materialistic uh, values still dominate today's society, but now it's got a little bit of company. It's got the biocentric and ecocentric perspectives. Now, of course, we also look at the indigenous culture's relationship with landscapes, and of course, those tend to be more biocentric and eco ecocentric in, in nature, but they also have ecocentric um, aspects to them. And it's, again, it's interesting to see Native Americans in today's society um, uh, really straddling the fence between two cultures and, and trying to reconcile biocentric and ecocentric perspectives with more anthropocentric perspectives. I think one thing I forgot to do, I'm going to get my pointer going. That way I can use that. Okay, a quick look at some definitions. And of course, we're not gonna read all these. You can actually read them yourself um, on your own time. But for now, we will really just look at anthropocentric as um, the frontier ethic. It represents the social paradigm that developed during the early early settling of America. And it, tend to, it tends to prioritize short-term material gains over the long-term health of the planet and humans. So that's anthropocentric. When you look at biocentric and ecocentric views, they really represent two variations on a more sustainable ethic. They both embrace the view that humans belong to a larger community of life and that it's worth, is worthy of our respect and protection. It represents a radical change to the lifelong standing and deeply rooted anthropocentric values and attitudes in Western culture, science, and politics. So these are two sets of values that really influence how we view landscapes. Now, let's look at uh, and compare how biocentric and ecocentric values 
as compared to anthropocentric values influence how we view human and human systems and natural systems. On one end of the spectrum, we have a view that human systems are entirely a subset of natural systems. And then if you move along the spectrum, you have another worldview that is a little bit more towards anthropocentric values where human systems and natural systems are certainly interlocked and they influence one another, but they are to one degree or another separate from one another and don't necessarily influence and are not dependent on one another to a large degree. You have another worldview where the human systems and natural systems are entirely separate. You wouldn't find too many people that believe this way or that see the world this way, but it's part of that spectrum. And then on the entire other end of the spectrum, you have a worldview that natural systems are actually a subset of human systems. So you have this perspective or this spectrum of values that really influence the way you see, uh, uh, the way you view landscapes. We'll come back to this later on in the presentation. So let's take a quick look at landscape ecology. We'll add this to the mix. Now that we got these um, ethical viewpoints um, that we've just kind of gone over, we're gonna look at landscape ecology because it explores both temporal and spatial patterns to help us understand a complex natural world and the interface with human systems. So we're going back to that human systems, natural systems interface, and we're really looking at temporal and spatial patterns, temporal and spatial patterns to help us make sense of, uh, of the human world and the interface with human systems. La uh, landscape ecology looks at the flow of matter and energy through landscapes. It also is really interested in the nature of changes in landscapes through time and space. It's very elastic in the scales and the context of time and space that it considers. You can look at diurnal patterns or daily patterns, or you can look at patterns over thousands of years. You can look at a square meter, meter of soil in the ecology and the dynamics in that meter of soil, or you can look at an entire continent in terms of how matter and energy flow through landscapes. So it's very elastic. And that kind of elasticity is just what we need when we're looking at uh, landscapes in Grand Canyon, because you're looking at geologic time as well as leave no trace, two very different time frames. So again, we're looking at the interface of natural systems and human systems and landscape ecology, and when we look at when we travel through landscapes. Um, human systems really consist of people living in towns and, and communities. And natural systems have more to do with not only deep time wilderness like Grand Canyon, but also legally designated wilderness areas. So you've got this interface between natural systems and human systems, and these red arrows really represent that interface that we're interested in um, with landscape ecology. So let's look at some patterns in the landscape. In wild and unbuilt landscapes, it's typically topography and vegetation that are most readily recognized. You can see the, the patterns in the landscape here um, where the green is the lower elevation, the white is alpine, the purple is more mountainous areas, and the, the, the brown is the transition zone between um, the, the mountains and the deserts. So we've got topography and vegetation types are really what's most easily recognized and readily recognized in wild landscapes. Now in urban landscapes, they're typically dominated by street patterns and the topography of buildings. But I invite you to consider the topography of a city as a landscape. Although it's completely built and it's concrete and steel, you can even, you know, it has an interesting kind of metaphor with, with canyons, the desert canyon lands. They are canyons of concrete and steel, nonetheless, they, and they are a landscape. So one thing to ask yourself and your students is, how have wild and urban landscapes influenced you? How have they influenced your participants? And how have these landscapes influenced American society and vice versa? Again, that play between our cultures, the predominant influence on landscapes or are landscapes the predominant influencer on cultures? It, that pendulum swings back and forth. So these are some questions you can actually entertain with your participants. Um, invite them while they're in this compelling, empowering 
landscape of Grand Canyon, um, think about a favorite spot or bioregion and the type of landscape that it's in. What do you, as an, as an instructor, what do your participants like most about this spot and its landscapes? And why is it one of your favorites? And then take that next step and ask yourself, how do those landscapes and that favorite spot or favorite bioregion compare with Grand Canyon? Because gaining a sense of place is really about gaining a sense of places. If you were to spend your whole life in Grand Canyon, you would know it really well. But until you leave the Grand Canyon and go check out someplace else, you can't really compare Grand Canyon and appreciate its uniqueness. And what your participants are doing in that moment when they're taking your class is they're exploring a new landscape. And it may, and it's probably very different than the landscape they live in. So ask them to kind of think about these questions and it helps them gain, you know, and take a few more steps towards a deeper sense of place in Grand Canyon. So let's look at some um, ecoregions in continental North America. Again, the different colors represent different, different types of vegetation. You see the boreal forest that wraps itself all the way around the globe, including North America. And then you've got um, um, these other bioregions and your students come from one of these bioregions. And so it's interesting for them to, again, compare where they come from with, in this case, the Rockies and the deserts of the Southwest. And you can see the Colorado Plateau in the context of this, the, the Rocky Mountain uplift and the Rocky Mountain uh, um, uh, bioregion, as well as the deserts of the Southwest. Here's another context um, in which we can view the Colorado Plateau, all the different bioregions and ecoregions in um, the lower 48. Again, your participants, they come from somewhere, um, probably maybe outside of the country, but this would be an example for them um, to, to really consider where am I, where do I come from? Where am I most familiar with? And where is the Colorado Plateau in relation to that? This is another uh, map. I really like this one just because it, it, it really um, jumps out at you in terms of the, ex the spatial extent of the basin and range. It is a huge biogeographical province and the Colorado Plateau is kind of nestled right up against it there. And this is, I love this photograph because it's a satellite of the Colorado Plateau and it shows it in the context of, of the American Southwest. And you can see that when we're in Flagstaff or in the Grand Canyon, we really are on the very western edge and in the southwestern quadrant of the Colorado Plateau. So let's look at the plateau and some of its boundaries. Just gonna get my... So on the southern end, we've got the Mogollon Rim. We can see that I'm in Prescott. I can, the Mogollon Rim is kind of my northern skyline. And uh, for folks up in Flagstaff and Grand Canyon, if you're lucky, well, if you're on, on top of the peaks, you can get a good view of the Mogollon Rim. That is the southern edge of the plateau. And then we come around to the, to the eastern side and we have the San Juan Mountains and the Uncompahgre Uplift. You turn around to the north and you have the Uinta Mountains uh, representing the, the northern border of the plateau. And then we have the Wasatch Mountains. So it's really, um, the plateau is characterized in general as being high on the sides and low in the middle. It's like a big bowl. And if you think of it as kind of a, a mixing bowl that has a spout, the spout is right there at the very, very bottom of the Grand Canyon because every drop of surface water that doesn't evaporate or sink into the ground eventually exits the, Grand Can exits the Colorado Plateau at the Grand Wash Cliffs, and that is the spout of the mixing bowl right there. So, Basin and Range Province. I've heard, I've had a, I had a geology professor describe the Basin and Range Province as caterpillars marching north. And if you look closely, it really does look like a whole bunch of caterpillars marching north. So the Colorado Plateau province is super diverse. There's many different types of landscapes and waterscapes, deserts, grasslands, woodlands and forests, spring seeps, wetlands and waterways of all sizes, as well as plateaus, mesas, buttes, spires, mountain ranges, volcanoes, caves, canyons, and more. It's ridiculous. Um, in terms of topography, it's hard to find a more diverse topography than when you find in the Grand Canyon and in the Colorado Plateau in general. And it's notable 
that 90% um, of the Colorado Plateau is Colorado River Basin. So they're not one and the same, but they are really superimposed on top of one another, and much of the plateau is the Colorado River Basin, 90% of it. So I invite you to look at the Colorado Plateau in any landscape, including the Grand Canyon, as a collection of landscape layers that are, that are connected. So they're, la they're landscape layers that are distinct, yet they're interconnected. And we're gonna use these landscape layers to really explore what it means to gain a deeper sense of place. So our first landscape layer is the geophysical landscape layer. It involves topography, geology, and soils and hydrology. The next landscape layer is the biological landscape layer. It's vegetation and wildlife, including humans. So think of the biological landscape layer as life draped upon the geophysical landscape. Think of biogeography and how plants and animals are draped across the landscape. That is your biological landscape. Now, if we tease humans out of this biological landscape, we are the human animal, we teach the human animal out of the biological landscape, we find the sociocultural landscape. It involves and includes communities, indigenous cultures, past and present, European cultures, global tourism, which we really see at Grand Canyon, social justice and ethical issues. This is the sociocultural landscape. It's actually a subset of the biological landscape. And then if we tease one more subset out of the sociocultural landscape, we find the political economic landscape. It involves local, state, and federal governments, land management agencies, conservation, preservation, and restoration, economics, and again, ethics. So the political economic landscape, you can think of it as most of the written rules that govern who does what on, in, on the Colorado Plateau. Much of the sociocultural landscape is unwritten. It's how we live and our customs. Much of the political landscape, almost all of it, is stuff that's written down on paper and its laws and policies and regulations. The next layer is the experiential layer. And although it is not a, you know, it's hard to see the experiential landscape, but you definitely, when you look out on a landscape, you view it through the lens of your own personal biases and life experiences. It has to do with your direct and secondhand exper experiences with a landscape, your perceptions, values, the symbolism that you associate with a particular landscape, your emotional and intellectual or cognitive connections or disconnections with that landscape. It's hugely important. And finally, because we live in an arid region, the hydroscape, very important. The seeps and springs and streams and rivers and groundwaters of the Colorado Plateau. So these all work together. They're separate layers, but they're connected. So these landscape layers change over space and time. We're going back to the, that landscape ecology um, slide where we're talking about changes over space and time. And those changes reveal cyclic patterns. And it's, you know, if you were to look back on the history of what's called hydraulic society, societies that live in arid regions, the same cycle happens over and over again. So that kind of cycle happens over hundreds or maybe hundreds and hundreds of years. Societies establish themselves in an arid land. They figured how to move water around on the surface. They move water around successfully and their populations grow. They stretch those resources so thin that any fluctuation in the availability of these resources tends to break the human systems that were built and they collapse. We are simply the next in line. It has happened so many times. And so uh, that kind of cyclic pattern happens as well as diurnal patterns. You know, um, when your participants are in the Grand Canyon, they recognize how cold it gets every morning and how hot it can get in the afternoon and how incredibly different the place feels. Those kind of cyclic patterns are really worth bringing out and highlighting with your participants. So these landscape layers change over space and time and they reveal cyclic patterns. Now here's an important slide. While each layer reveals its own unique collection of stories, there's also an infinite number and variety of stories that combine and intertwine them. So um, as outdoor instructors, 
you can use these landscape layers as an organizing tool for your own professional development. Your participants can use them to more mindfully explore new landscapes and deepen their sense of place. Typically, you um, folks um, gravitate to their favorite landscape layer. If you're a big birder, you go to the biological landscape. If you're a rock hound, you go to the geophysical. If you're really intrigued by policy and law, you might go political landscapes, the political landscape, or you might go to the sociocultural if you're intrigued of how cultures live in landscapes. If you're a water nut or a big boater, you might go to the hydroscape. But start with your favorite landscape or the landscape that gives you kind of the confidence and competent. And then the, the important next step is to challenge yourself to go explore the other landscapes with that confidence and competence you have with your favorite landscape. And eventually you come up with a balanced, deeper sense of place on your terms. And you can do this as an instructor, but you can, and you can also encourage your participants to do this as well. Because exploring a landscape like Grand Canyon, any landscape is a very daunting task. You just, you're, the first, you know, you're just, you're like a deer in headlights. You're going, where do I start? It is very complex. If I can barely understand the geology, now we're talking about how to save this place and the national park management issues. Um, it's just really, it can be daunting even for a, for a professional. You can imagine what it's like for participants. So these layers can help them make sense of their journey and have it be more mindful and less, overwhelm, uh, less overwhelming. So let's look at the hydroscape briefly. We're gonna look at each one of these layers just for a few minutes for a few slides each and kind of look at what that, what that landscape layer um, means in the context of Grand Canyon and uh, the Colorado Plateau. The hydroscape in an arid region rep is represented by the waters that flow over, through, and under the land. The interconnectedness of an arid landscape is deeply rooted in its flowing waters. And the hydroscape is really um, represented in a large part by these riparian areas or waterside areas. These are all, these are the habitats that are adjacent to the seeps and springs and rivers and, um, and they're called riparian areas. These are corridors and patches of comparatively lush vegetation and wildlife. And in an arid landscape like the Colorado Plateau, riparian areas function as a keystone habitat. What is a keystone habitat and why are riparian areas on the Colorado Plateau so important? And how do they connect all these landscape layers? We'll take a look here. So. On the Colorado Plateau and in Grand Canyon, riparian areas actually represent, I say way less than 1%. It's actually 0.03% of the landscape, a very little sliver, yet they support 35% of the biodiversity. When you're talking about mammals, 80% of the mammals in Arizona are directly or indirectly dependent on riparian areas. So that's what we call a, a classic keystone habitat where they are rare but their ecological and overall influence on the landscape is way outpaced and outscaled to their, to their um, uh, total volume in this case. It's kind of like an ecological bottleneck or a large ecological ripple effect. Um, waterways are the Earth's circulatory systems. They are the veins and arteries. The Earth's um, um, rivers and streams and wetlands function just like the arteries in our body. When our body is injured, it's our bloodstream that helps repair it. It's a huge piece of that repairing uh, process. And the same thing with ecosystems. They need the veins and arteries to case stay healthy. Um, we as recreators in a dry landscape, we really can't have too many dry camps. You can have one, maybe two, but you can't have too many. You're always looking for water and making sure you camp near water. Um, we have a strong preference, to put it mildly, for watered sites not just us, but cultures of the past. In fact, 90% of the inventoried um, archeological sites in Grand Canyon are along tributaries and at deltas. So it's not just us that need water in a dry landscape. Everyone who's ever been here gravitates to water. Um, the nexus of the water, water systems, food systems, and energy systems is intense. Um, if you really want to make a big difference in water conservation, Take a good hard look at your diet and look at where your energy comes from. 
the nexus of water systems, food systems, and energy systems is something that is no, um, it, it's um, what we call a leverage point in systems thinking. You get a lot of effort. With a little effort, you get a lot of results when you look at this nexus. And finally, as uh, those of us who have lived in the West know, water flows uphill to money and power. And that is not a metaphor. It actually flows uphill to money and power. So the hydroscape, that's why it's so important in any arid land, especially the Colorado Plateau and Grand Canyon. So let's take a look at the geophysical landscape, the topography, the geology, the soils and hydrology. Now, this is stuff that, you know, if you've been, uh, if you're a Grand Canyon Conservancy Field Institute instructor, you know that the Grand Canyon is made up of primarily sedimentary rock layers, that it's a huge Paleozoic stack of rock layers, each layer representing a distinct historical time period with distinct environmental conditions. Now, these sedimentary rock layers actually help create many seeps and springs that add to the plateau's hydroscape. So it's interesting to note that Arizona has the highest density in the highest number of springs of any state in the lower 48, even though it's dry. And that's because you have this interesting combination of sedimentary rock layers, many of which are sandstone and the, the water actually flows through the porous sandstone, but when it hits a more impermeable layer of shale or mudstone, it actually doesn't sink down anymore. And if that mud or shale stone is tilted, it, it tends to, it flows on top of that. And when it reaches a canyon wall, you get a seeps and spring. So that combination of geology and then complex canyon land topography creates more seeps and springs than you can shake a stick at. So it's dry, but we actually have more seeps and springs than any state in the nation. Um, also, in contrast to the plateau's red rock interior, the boundary of the plateau actually consists of forested highlands. And these forested highlands really act as water towers. They're nature's water towers. Every winter, they collect heaps of snow, not as much snow as they used to, but still, they heaps of snow. And then, thanks to the warming spring temperatures, they slowly release that to the environment. And sure enough, those water towers are what feed the Colorado River system every spring, every summer. And that's what creates what I call a wide and wild flow regime for this Colorado River, because how fast that snow melts in any given warming period dictates how quickly and exactly when the Colorado River ends up having its peak flows for the summer. You know what's going to happen in the summer, but you don't know exactly how long it's going to last and exactly what dates it's going to happen. That's because it all depends on these water towers and how quickly or slowly they release their water. So it creates this ironic situation of this incredibly dry interior fed by the water towers, and you've got this amazing Colorado River running right through the center of it. This is just a great example. This is the infamous dragon map of Grand Canyon. It represents um, the geologic features, and each geologic layer is a different color. Well, once this map was done, and the, the, the folks that made this map stepped back, they realized that they had created a work of art. And in fact, it's not uncommon to see this map up on people's living room wall as a piece of art, not as a geology map, but as the dragon map, as it's called. And it's a great example of how science and art can really do the dance. So let's look at the biological landscape, vegetation, wildlife, including humans, the human animal. So um, Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau's biological landscape really encompasses three of the four North American deserts. Um, we have the Great Basin, we have the Mojave, the Sonoran, and then we have the Colorado Plateau semi-desert all converging on the Colorado Plateau and the Grand Canyon. So it's really unique in that it has characteristics of all of these deserts as well as, as we'll see in the next slide, the Rocky Mountain influence. So the Colorado Plateau really represents a mixing of Rocky Mountain and all these deserts, and the Grand Canyon is really where this diversity is converges in its in in a kind of a crescendo, if you will. So the Colorado Plateau's extreme elevational range, over eleven thousand feet in elevational difference from the lowest point to the highest points. 
co combined with the rugged topography creates really distinct microclimates and results in a complex mixing of plants and animals to form a mosaic of biological communities found really nowhere else on the planet. You can have, you can have a, a stand of mixed conifer right next to desert grasslands and prickly pear in the Grand Canyon. I mean, right next to each other. And so with that, those vegetation communities right next to each other that are typically separated by thousands of feet in elevation, they're right next to each other. You can have a, uh, you can have a gray jay that's a neighbor with a cactus wren. And those two are going, who in the heck are you? And what are you doing here? But nonetheless, those, uh, that kind of mixing of typically very separate uh, uh, plant and animal communities happens in the Grand Canyon and all over the plateau. So it's a biological landscape that is globally unique. So the plateau, the, the Grand Canyon, um, not only is it, um, does it represent four of the five North American deserts, it actually represents five of the seven North American life zones. So the biological landscape in and of itself is a mind blower. There's a lot of different stuff going on down there. We have Lower Sonoran, Upper Sonoran, Transition, Canadian, and Hudsonian. The only ones missing are subtropical and Arctic alpine. Um, Grand Canyon and the plateau serves as an ecological refuge with relatively undisturbed remnants of dwindling ecosystems like boreal forest and desert riparian communities. It's home to numerous endemic, rare, threatened, and endangered plant and animal species, stuff that you already know uh, since you work down there. So I just wanna invite you to think of Grand Canyon and any deep canyon as an inverted mountain because the plants and animals are distributed in a canyon much like they're distributed across the San Francisco peaks. As you hike up the San Francisco peaks, you hike through different life zones. When you hike down through Grand Canyon, you're actually hiking down through different life zones and you can think of it as, uh, oh, as a mountain, as an inverted mountain. So, uh, oh, there we go. Um, so these are some of the examples of some of the threatened and endangered species. And I just had to throw in the cougar because he's just plain cool. And you, maybe some of you have actually seen some of these, uh, these species while you're down there, but they're all species that are either endemic to Grand Canyon or endangered or threatened. So let's look at the social cultural landscape, the communities of people that live in, in uh, across the Colorado Plateau, the communities, indigenous cultures, past and present, European cultures, um, the global tourism factor, and again, social justice and ethical issues. Um, if we look at the social cultural past of the Colorado Plateau, we know that human occupation stretches back at least 12,000 years to the end of the Pleistocene. Um, the earliest plateau inhabitants were Paleo-Indians in the Archaic culture. And then later on, about a thousand years ago, we had the ancestral Puebloans. And it's interesting to note that the, 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 at the height of the ancestral Puebloans occupation, there was probably about a million folks on the plateau. And that's about the same amount of people that, live, that actually live on the plateau today. So a rich cultural past um, not only indigenous, but also European, you, you know, you can't really look at the sociocultural um, landscape of Grand Canyon without uh, recognizing John Wesley Powell. He's one of the, the, the more infamous and famous um, uh, characters in the European history of the Colorado Plateau, Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. Um, he was the, one of the first Europeans to successfully navigate and systematically study the Colorado River through Grand Canyon. The dude had one arm and he scaled the canyons with the barometer the size of a, size of a Cocker Spaniel. And he, with one arm, he scaled those canyon walls, sometimes with the help of Bradley's pants. All right, another aspect of sociocultural landscapes of the plateau, um, in addition to the rich sociocultural past, we've got 29 distinct Native American groups that live on the plateau today. Nearly a third of the plateau is indigenous tribal lands today. Now, of course, when I have my own students ask me, so, you know, where, you know, how much, you know, when we're standing in a particular place, my students will sometimes ask me, so was this, you know, indigenous land? And of course, the question is, it was all indigenous land. Every inch of it was indigenous land before we showed up. 
So um, the fact that they're now relegated to reservations is kind of indistinct. Uh, it's, it, it's ironic because this was all their land before. And that leads us into this, this uh, idea of acknowledging country, um, really showing that we are aware and that we have respect for in the indigenous nations of the Colorado Plateau, honoring their long and continuing relationship with the land. And that's something that's important to do, um, I think, with any visitor to Grand Canyon or the Colorado Plateau is acknowledge that every square inch of it used to be indigenous lands. And today, we've got folks like the, the Wallapai, uh, we have the Navajo, the White, Pouton, Apa White Mountain Apache, Hopi, the uh, Kaibab Band of the Paiute, and the Havasupai. Um, all own land and have reservation lands in or near Grand Canyon National Park and the Plateau. It's also important to note that there are many traditional cu cultural properties of these groups that are riparian related. Um, traditional cultural properties are specific places where um, um, the, these uh, tribal nations still go to for cultural or maybe medicinal purposes. And the Grand Canyon is full of them. Mooney Falls is one example. So the social cultural landscapes of the Colorado Plateau today is likely one of the most culturally diverse regions on the North American continent. Um, there is a, a book uh, produced by Terra Lingua back in the 80s called Preserving the Uniqueness of the Colorado Plateau. And it claims that the Colorado Plateau is in fact, I think it said it was the third most culturally diverse spot on the planet. And um, it's because of these different groups of people that still occupy the plateau today. So let's look at the political economic landscape, those written rules, um, the local and state and federal governments, the land management agencies, conservation, preservation and restoration advocates, and of course, um, economics and ethical issues. So it has, the political economic landscape has a lot to do with boundaries and designations, okay? And this shows you the complexity of the political economic landscape of the plateau. This nice, huge gray area here, that's the Navajo Reservation. And then we have all kinds of uh, uh, um, federal government uh, uh, designations from national forests to national monuments, national recreation areas, um, and then tribal lands. Very complex. So a lot of text on this slide, so I'm going to work you through it paragraph by paragraph. The political economic landscape conveys yet another story. The story of how do we as a society decide what the best uses are for these regional lands and waters. These decisions are made by local, state, and federal and tribal governments with input and advocacy from the public and industry stakeholders like timber, livestock, mining, tourism industry, recreation industry, conservation and preservation agendas. So in theory, these folks are listening to all of these folks down here. Sometimes in public meetings, sometimes in the um, in DC from lobbyists, but they hear from everybody. And then we have designations, designations like national forests, national parks, BLM lands, wilderness areas, wild and scenic rivers, and indigenous tribal lands. Each one of these designations comes with a package of regulations, policies, and laws for how the lands and waters are best managed the political economic landscape. And of course, this landscape affects all the other landscapes of the plateau. Let's take a quick look at the hydropolitical landscape of the Colorado River. It's worth kind of teasing out the hydropolitical landscape within the larger political economic landscape. And this is actually the Colorado River system as represented by all of the reservoirs, which are represented by these big cups diversions that are represented by these spigots, and then the headwaters, which are represented by these funnels. And this shows you that the Colorado River is the most diverted, dammed, and over-allocated river in the world. And of course, we're really looking at, in our neighborhood, we've got Lake Powell and Glen Canyon Dam, which is just upstream of Grand Canyon, and then we have Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. Grand Canyon 
and the Colorado River and its stretch of the Colorado River is actually bookended by two of the largest dams in the world. In fact, Hoover Dam was the largest human built structure in the world up until a couple de decades ago. So um, our particular, let's say, uh, place of interest, Grand Canyon, happens to be sandwiched between these, these two monumental uh, human uh, uh, um, buildings, if you constructs, if you will. And of course, as we already know, water flows uphill towards money and power. And this is a great example of that. Uh, again, we come back to Powell and thinking about the political landscape, he actually suggested back in 1878, he suggested that we organize our political boundaries based on watersheds. He thought we should create watershed states with each state having control over its own water resources and all the potential agricultural and animal resources within. And that you would not transport water out of one state, watershed state into another watershed state. The number of people and, the, and the, um, their settlement patterns would, would be commensurate with the surface waters in each watershed state. And it begs, it just makes you wonder what the West would be like if we actually had watershed states as opposed to the ones we have today. And in fact, this is an interesting poster, and it begs the question, it shows you what if Powell's proposal had actually succeeded? What if we had watershed states where water could not leave a watershed state? And the number of people that lived in each watershed state represented the water that was available in that state. And that states were, or, or the American states were defined by watershed boundaries. And they actually have all 50 states, but defined by um, watersheds. That's an alternative view of the political landscape layer based on uh, reality of, of surface water availability. So our last landscape layer, the experiential landscape. Um, it involves uh, the personal life experiences that you bring to any particular landscape experience. Um, direct and secondhand experiences, perceptions, values, and symbolism emotional and cognitive connections or disconnections. So the experiential landscape, it kind of begs the question, what is your relationship with the landscape on an individual, community, and societal level? It involves direct versus secondhand experiences. Do you know this landscape personally from going out there or is it from the TV or government reports? What is that balance? Um, in fact, one of Powell's realizations that the West need, needed to be s settled s differently than the East was the fact that he actually went out and looked at the West, and he had a hard time convincing the senators and congressmen back East that the West was different. They were convinced that the West could be settled like the East because they had no direct experiences with the landscape. So the experiential landscape has to do with what direct experiences have you had with that landscape and what secondhand experiences? What emotional and cognitive connections do you have or disconnections? What symbolism do you attach to a particular landscape? It's really not uncommon for folks back east or even folks like me who have moved from back east and have lived in the west for most of their life. I still view the, the you know, the, the, Ameri the southwestern landscapes as kind of, is, is harsh. It's tough. There's prickly things and biting things and stinging things, and it's hot and dry. It's tough. And so you have this symbolism with the West that it's just kind of an adversary, that you really got to kind of lean into it to be happy. Um, and so that kind of symbolism is stuff that really kind of we bring to, the, to our own experiential landscape. And of course, and I've said this with the other landscape, but this experiential landscape, it really influences how one views all the other landscape layers and landscapes and nature in general. And it actually goes back to this whole biocentric, ecocentric, anthropocentric perspective of, you know, where on this, uh, on this spectrum do you find yourself? And I think at this point, it might be really important for me to acknowledge that you don't pick a camp and say, well, I'm definitely biocentric and I'm certainly not anthropocentric because I just don't think that way. Well, we're all, all three of these. In your lifetime, you make decisions that might look incredibly anthropocentric in nature. So we are all three of these things many, many times throughout our life. Um, I just moved back to Ohio to see my, my mom, but I flew in a plane. 
which is one of the most destructive forms of travel you can possibly imagine. Yet I did it because I wanted to see my mom. So I made a very anthropocentric decision based on family love. And in fact, you know, love for family members or passionate feelings about um, a hu an anthropocentric uh, event or person is often a reason why you you behave more anthropocentric, right? Having kids can be one of the most destructive things you can do to the planet, yet we have them because we want them. So just to bring this to closure, um, these landscape layers can help you explore, learn from, and experience landscapes more mindfully, both you as instructors and your participants. So I invite you to discover the stories that these landscapes reveal to you, create your own stories, and encourage your participants to create their own landscape stories based on your own or their own firsthand experiences and to deepen your Grand Canyon sense of place. It's something that you can do as a professional, and then it's something you can kind of role model for your students. Really invite them to mindfully explore the landscapes of the Grand Canyon and use these different layers to help them make sense of it. At least they can pick a place to start, you know, because some of you just don't know where you're starting and um, identify where their strengths are and have them start with that landscape layer and then challenge them to explore the other landscape layers through the lens of their landscape layer of choice. So that is, uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. And I really would like to invite you to ask questions or submit comments. And you can do that um, um, during, on the 26th during the round table discussion from 9.30 to 12. And I know uh, Chris has something to say about uh, another way to submit comments. Yeah, thank you so much, Joel. That was an incredible presentation. It definitely got me really excited to dive into all of these things with participants on future trips. And uh, I just want to remind everybody to tune in the 26th from 9.30 to 12. And uh, if you have an opportunity to watch these videos ahead of time and submit questions ahead of time, we really appreciate that because it'll help us move things more smoothly. If you don't have an opportunity to, we will have a chat room available during the live Q&A session so you can submit questions at that time and we'll get them to the, the people that you're asking for. So once again, Joel, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Chris.